Let's talk about the the different types of or the different metabolic types that you both outline in the book. And I'd love, you know, you mentioned labs and waist circumference. I think this is a really great time for us to sort of delineate between the the four different types, the waist circumference that we might be looking at. And then, of course, it's, you know, we want to label them, but then also what are some of the action items that we might think about? So, Kristen, let's talk about, let's start off with the first one, the preventer. preventer. Mm-hmm. So this is where we almost have like a bit of a rubric uh, rubric here. So we have healthy and lean, and then we're going to move to healthy and non-lean, unhealthy and lean, and then unhealthy and non-lean. Yeah. So let's start with the first one, preventer, healthy and lean. So what is the characteristics of someone who falls in this metabolic type? So healthy and lean, let's number one, define what lean and healthy, and we could figure out what unhealthy is by that definition as well, right? So lean is going Great. to be yeah. defined as having a normal waist circumference. So for a woman, that's going to be 35 inches or less. Why did we go with such a strong stance on waist circumference with all of our metabolic types? Because we know that BMI is a flawed number. We know that BMI only tells some of the story, but it doesn't really tell someone's health. I've been a dietitian in integrative medicine at Cleveland Clinic for 20 years now. And for most of my career, I would go into the electronic medical record and I would look at what's the designation of my patient. And it would always be based on BMI. Right. Okay. This person is obese. This person is underweight. Right. But it doesn't really tell the story of health. So healthy and lean means that that person's waist circumference is normal. Okay. So that's the lean. And then healthy means their metabolic numbers are also normal. So your lipid panel is normal. You don't have sleep apnea. Your hemoglobin A1C is normal. So your labs look good. And so does your weight. Who is the preventer, right? So why do we even mention this person? Well, we know that there's some genetic indicators for looking at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this could be someone who has a very strong genetic background for type 2 diabetes in the family, for someone who's had fatty liver. Maybe their mom had fatty liver when they were in utero. That makes them more prone to developing the disease as well. So it's not someone who has to go as hardcore as the regenerator that's going to be on the opposite end. But, you know, you want to keep you want to keep an eye on this. Maybe you do watch your drinking. Maybe you do make sure that you're getting enough color in your diet, enough plants. So that's how we define the first one. So I, first, I just want to say I'm so happy that we're not all using BMI right. because we know if you're muscle, if you're someone who's putting on muscle right. as I am and as I'm hoping that my Bettys are, like that's also going to skew your BMI because muscle weighs more than yes. fat. Mm-hmm. I tend to look at FF, like fat-free mass index. That's sort of the, you know, because that's sort of taking into account your muscle. But you mentioned lipid, HbA1c. We've mentioned fasting glucose a little bit. Just can you give me some ranges? Are there ranges that you look at or is there like an optimal range that you're trying to get patients in or is this, or is this going to be bio-individual? I just wanted to ask that before we move on to the next next uh, metabolic type. So I I mean I will let Dr. Hannane add to this as well, but for for me if all the numbers are normal, the only place where I might be a little bit more put someone in the next type would be if the hemoglobin A1c is on the verge. So if you are like a 5.7, a 5.6, you're not quite pre-diabetic, but you're one percentage point from there, and this is a three-month marker of blood sugar management, then I might go a little bit more aggressive, probably isn't the right word, but that's that's the blood sugar is what, as a dietitian, I'm looking at the most to determine what's going to be the best option mm-hmm. for you, much more than the lipid panel for me. So if even if your LDL is high and your HDL is low, but your blood sugar is normal, I'm probably going to take a little bit of a different approach. But I'll let Dr. Hanane speak to that as well. Yeah. Remember, we mentioned uh, earlier metabolic dysfunction. This is a disease associated with metabolic syndrome. So what's metabolic dysfunction? How do you know if you do have metabolic dysfunction? Well, number one, we mentioned the waist circumference. But uh, but the second part, uh, to answer your question, there are really four factors. Factor number one is blood pressure. And we like it to be less than 120 over 90. Number two is glucose, sugar. And we like fasting glucose to be less than 110. Or like Kristen mentioned, hemoglobin A1C, which tell you, give you an idea about blood sugar control over the last two to three months. We like it to be less than 6% ideally. Uh, and then, so that's number two, sugar. Number three, triglyceride. Not cholesterol, but triglyceride. 
and we like that to be less than 150. And then lastly, HDL, which is, as mentioned earlier, it's kind of, you know, the good cholesterol. We know HDL as the good cholesterol, you know, even we don't necessarily, you know, uh, you know, I don't like the the term good and bad, but anyway, that's HDL, the good cholesterol, and we like it to be high. You want the good one to be high. We like it to be more than, you know, 40 for men and 50 for women. Um, so we like that number to be high. And so those are the numbers, the kind of, you know, the uh, objective number we look at in addition to worse, worse confidence. It turns out if you have three out of five, including the waist confidence, and then you have metabolic dysfunction. If you have three abnormal tests out of five of the mentioned, then you have metabolic dysfunction. Okay, great. Yeah, because I, I remember running the, especially for HbA1c, I remember running the the numbers like 5.2, I think translates to 100 megs per deciliter. Like that's still, like for me, that's high. I feel like, you know, 100, I, I know the pre-diabetic is, I think it's 126 or like under one, you know, one. And maybe you can redirect me here. I think it's 126, but I always like everything under 100. Like I like it 80 to 100. And maybe that's just me being a stickler for, for numbers. But yeah, like 5.6, like that's like we we already we we're already dealing with some dysfunction in the body, right? So okay, so super appreciate you adding some color there. So I I interrupted you, Kristen. So we did the preventer, which is healthy and lean, and then the fine tuner, healthy and non-lean. So what does that mean? And then we can get to recalibrator and, and regenerate. So that means that your waist circumference is higher than normal, higher than where we would like it. So you're carrying some belly fat, right? Because that's that's the other thing with waist circumference. We are looking at where the fat is most metabolically active. We're not looking at the fat in your your butt area, your thighs area. That's not as active as when we have it in the midsection, right? Which is close to organs, things like that. So you, your waist circumference is too high, but your numbers are not indicative of poor health. So your numbers, all your glucose, all those numbers that Dr. Hananay just went over all look normal within normal range. So again, because of the waste, we'll go a little bit more aggressive than we would the preventer, but we're not going to go, you know, as, as much as we would someone who has everything going wrong. I have a, I want to play devil's advocate for a moment if I can. If someone has, let's say they're, let's, they would be a fine tuner. So let's say someone has a, a waist circumference that's 35, let's say inches, but their waist to hip ratio is about 0.7 or 0.8. Would you still consider them a fine tuner? Are we, are, do you care about the waist to hip ratio or is it just the absolute measurement of the waist that we're, that we're looking at here? I, I do look at waist to hip ratio and that is really where we're getting into the personalized nutrition approach, right? So like for, for our patients in integrative medicine, we go very deep into all aspects of measurement. You know, with, for, for us, for the book perspective, it was easier just to focus on waist versus the height, the, the waist to his ratio. Right. But yes, you know, we would look at all those factors and we would look at other things that actually go along with their lifestyle, right? Are they someone who is living in a area that has a lot of pollution? Are they sedentary? There's so many factors that go into this, but this is kind of like kind of the dirty nitty gritty of, all right, let's look at these things and then we can choose which plan you go into. We're also very clear that, your metabolic type doesn't have to dictate the plan you're in, right? The plan you're in, you could go in and out of plans and you can determine what works for you based on your personal preferences, what you can sustain long term. So, again, as humans, there's really no one size fits all. And that's true for our plans as well. There's not one plan that goes with each and every yeah. aspect. There is that individual, that personalized approach that is so important. I love that. Awesome. All right, let's do the next two. So we did preventer and fine tuner. Now we're in unhealthy and yep. lean. So this is what you've called the recalibrator. the recalibrator. So this is someone who might come and say, I am skinny fat. All right. So we, I hear that a lot. Oh, my gosh, my numbers are all over yeah. the place. But yet, like, hey, I'm still a size six. Or the, the scale still tells me I'm healthy, but my numbers don't. Right. So this is kind of addressing, OK, how do we define health? And as everyone on this calls no, call knows, the FDA has has yet to define health, right? We're still waiting for them to do that. They will soon. But we don't have a definition, really, of health, good health. So really, this is looking at, all right, well, 
if your numbers are not where they should be, whatever that means, even though you can still get into the same genes you had in college, does that mean you are healthy? So that's where we really get into those conversations there and then maybe look at an even more aggressive plan than we did for the person whose waist circumference was high versus the person who's not high. These are the tofies, right? These are the thin on the outside, yes. but rel- like relatively fat on the inside, yes. even though I think that's a terrible name. But yes, and we often find that like I, you know, I'm part Arabic. So we often find like our Asians are beautiful. Asians, you know, Indians, people from Pakistan, that, that you know, and through the Middle East as well. You can be sort of thin, you know, like the size six, to, you know, to your point, but you're, but you're now your lipids are a little wonky. The blood blood glucose is out of range, you know, that kind of thing. So that's something to to be considered considered as well. The last category that you outline in the book is called the regenerator. So now this is unhealthy and not lean or unlean. What is that? And then let maybe we can spend a little bit of time on this category specifically in terms of what we might think about doing about it. So we go into the fact that you've got those three factors that Dr. Hannanay describes. So you've got the high blood pressure or maybe your LDL is high, your HDL is low. So you have three of the factors and your waist circumference is over 35 if you're a female and then over 40 if you're a male. So your waist circumference is is high as well. Uh, You know, what are the things we do here? I mean, this is really where we're going to look at someone who's most at risk for insulin resistance, for PCOS, and of course, because of that, for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So, you know, we really, it it doesn't really matter how we, in my, at least in my practice, how we position the conversation. Well, we don't have to say, let's, let's, let's look at a fatty liver diet. We could say, okay, Let's look at a diet that is going to be the best for lowering inflammation, because we know that we've got inflammatory factors going on with that type of environment, and what's going to be best for better blood sugar management. So that's really the conversation that we can start based on that last metabolic group. And we know in this group, okay, we know that we have to focus on gaining more muscle. We know we have to focus on lowering the waist size. We know we have to probably focus on improvements of diet. But that is the place where when you are sitting across from your dietitian or your physician, okay, let's talk about what works for you, right? So even just, you know, hearing you, Dr. Stephanie, talk about being, you know, thinking about being Arabic, like one of the things that we see in the studies is that if you don't adhere to cultural, religious, and personal preferences, it doesn't matter what diet I prescribe to you, you'll never follow it long term. All right. You'll follow it short term. It's hard. Follow it short term. It's the food you love, right? I mean, I'm Hispanic. Yeah. So there's there's very different foods that I may have had growing up than you did. Right. And I, I don't want to give those foods up. Yeah. So how do we weave that conversation in with our patients about, hey, you know, you can have these foods every once in a while. We're not saying never have this particular food. Let's look at what works for you and what you can sustain today, tomorrow, and five years from now. I mean, that's, I think that's the whole point of this. This is, that's the key nugget for this whole show is like the diet that's going to work for you is the diet that you most enjoy doing over a long delta. You know, it's like, you're going to, you know, I don't, you know, maybe there's something that your grandmother cooked and when, you know, you smell it, it conjures up, you know thoughts of when you were younger. I certainly have those foods on on both my both my mother and my father's side where there's, you know, you you give me Lebanese food and I'm just like putty in yep. your hands. Like yep. <laughs> you know, I just love it. Right. But it's it, but that's also the you know, making sure that we can integrate some of these foods that are, as you were saying, that are culturally appropriate, certainly around religious holidays and all of that, like that all really matters into our enjoyment of life. And that's really the best prognosis that you have. It's like, do you, it's the same with an exercise program. The exercise program that works for you is the one that you enjoy doing. And then you can do it over consistently over a long right. delta. That's the one that's going to yeah. work, right? I'm always asked like, what's the best program? And what is it that you do? And it's like, well, I do the things that I love. I love to squat. I love to Mm -hmm. pull up. Like those are the things that really give me a lot of pleasure in the gym and I enjoy doing them. But someone might have like, I don't know, bunk shoulder or bad Mm -hmm. hip or something and they're not going to enjoy doing those things as much. So we have to think about what are some of the, you know, things that bring you a lot of joy. And in this, in this, 
uh, case we're talking about in the food yeah. realm, like what are some of the things that you love to eat? And then how can we maybe make some tweaks? Maybe the portion size is a little, you know, that's usually a really big deal, it's like portion size, but then maybe it's not so much rice with kibbe, mm-hmm. right? Or like, you know, in my case, like it's like rice with like a skewer of meat, let's say on top of it. Maybe it's not all the, maybe it's just, maybe it's just the kibbe yeah. or maybe it's just some grilled vegetables on the side. Like that's also very sort of adhering to sort of the cultural and there. we can look at how often you have them as well, I think. I think that's an important factor. I, I had someone right. ask me the other day, you know, in right. Dominican Republic, we've got tostones and they're like, they're platanos and they're fried and they're delicious. And someone said, well, you know, they're delicious. How can I make a baked tostone? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you can't. You have to deep fry it. That's what a tostone. I mean, you can, yeah. but it's not going to be the same. But the thing is, it's not when you have the fried tostone right. 10% of the time, you have it once a week. It's when it, ends up on your plate every day. Right. right? So it's not the 10% of the time. Yes. Oh, that's such a good, that's such a good right? point. So it's like, okay, so like, mm-hmm. if you want to have donuts with your kids on Sundays, have donuts, right? But you're having it on a Sunday. You're not having it every day for breakfast. So I think we need to like that. When I say give ourselves a break, we need to consider that like it's part of how we define a healthy relationship with food. The 10% bucket is not really going to impact your health if the 90% bucket looks really good. Yeah, that's such a great point. And I would argue that the 10% actually allows you to stay compliant yes. the 90% of the time. Because mm-hmm. if you're always on a diet, like that's also psychologically very, very difficult. Yep. 